uh, you are just muted. Can you unmute yourself? Yes. Are you able to see the screen and hear me? Yes, we can see it and hear you well. Thank you very much. All right, good. Thank you. So it's, my name's Rebecca Sentko. I'm going to be talking about a seat at the table, finding your confidence to lead. Before I start, I'd like to thank the United Conference of Women Leadership and Pharma for the opportunity to speak today. It's great to be here, but I do have to say when I was first asked to give this presentation, my initial thought was, of course not. What would I talk about and why would people want to hear from me? But then my inner voice thought, why not? You should say yes. You have a lot to say. Then I realized saying yes to doing this webinar is a lot like stepping into leadership. You don't have to do it, but if you have the confidence to say yes and take your seat at the table, so many opportunities can open up for you. So how do you get the confidence to say yes? Confidence is having the courage to try something without knowing how it will go. Confidence is the feeling of trust or belief in your abilities. We aren't born with confidence. It takes focus and intentional work, and it's really hard for some people to gain this confidence. So why does confidence even matter? Self-confidence can help you become more successful in both your personal and professional life. It's important to be confident when you are a leader because you need to inspire others to follow your vision. If you aren't confident in yourself, it's hard to convince others to be confident in you. Ultimately, you need to learn to be confident if you want to get into leadership. So how do we find the confidence to say yes? When you don't see many women at the table, when you don't have role models that you relate to, when you have other responsibilities in your personal life, or when you aren't sure how to get there. I would like to share some things that have helped me become more confident over the years. One of the most important things to learn to improve confidence is to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. To become a leader, you, you will be uncomfortable sometimes, whether that's speaking in public, having a difficult conversation with an employee, sharing your ideas, or even accepting assignment you may not feel ready for yet. Being uncomfortable is how you grow, and growth helps increase your confidence further. Everyone understands that when you start exercising or do a different type of workout, you may become uncomfortable for a while. Your muscles ache, you may not have the moves down, so you feel self-conscious. This is known when you're exercising, but we need to move this into the rest of our lives as well. Moving into the unknown, and in this case leadership, can feel the same way sometimes. The key is to get comfortable with being uncomfortable because you will have to venture into your unknown to do this, which can feel scary and uncomfortable sometimes. But it's necessary if this is where you want to be. If you aren't able to be uncomfortable, it's hard, enough, it's hard to step out far enough to be noticed and considered for opportunities. I've found there are two key things to do this. The first is to have a growth mindset. In a growth mindset, people believe that their abilities can be developed through hard work. What you are born with is just the starting point. This creates a love of learning and a resilience that is essential for great accomplishment. Learning about this mindset can help you believe that it's okay to be wrong, it's okay to fail, and it's okay to not know everything. Yet, the concept of yet is an important aspect in the growth mindset. It signifies that just because you can't do something yet, you can learn how to. It's about the journey more than the destination. I told my eight-year-old daughter that I was doing this presentation. She said, I am confident. I asked her how she became confident. She said, like when we were rock climbing, I couldn't get very far up the wall the first time. Each time I tried, I got a little farther up. It got a little easier and I kept trying. And then I finally was able to do it. This is a great example of what the growth mindset is. It's okay to not be able to do something yet, but you keep trying and get better and better at it. As you see progress, it can help increase your confidence. 
If you want to learn more about a growth mindset, Carol Dweck wrote about it initially in her book called Mindset, and there are a lot of resources online too. The second concept that's been critical is to learn to embrace vulnerability. Vulnerability is uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. It's the feeling we get when we step out of our comfort zone. It's doing something that forces us to give up control. When you open yourself up to vulnerability, you also open yourself up to opportunity. Vulnerability can help you get comfortable with being uncomfortable, which as I said, helps increase confidence. We need to be okay with vulnerability to try things we aren't good at, to talk about ideas to, that others may not be talking about, to trust other people to do the work instead of doing it all ourselves, to confront your fears. If vulnerability is something that you can work on, there are some great books by Brene Brown about this topic, specifically Daring Greatly and The Gifts of Imperfection. They've been a great help in my um, in my approach to uh, becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable. Owning your strengths is another concept for, um, for increasing your confidence. Sometimes it can be hard for women to say what they are good at. You may be good at it, but you think other people are good at it too. This kind of discounts ourselves. Your strengths are your strengths. This isn't about what other people are good at. It's about you. Focus on your gifts not what you feel you may lack, which can really help build confidence. One way to do this is to make a list of things that you're good at. No one else has to see this list. You can keep it, um, keep it on your phone or someplace that you can easily access it whenever you need a boost of confidence. This list can include things that you're good at both at work or outside of work. And you can add to it as you find things that you're good at. Think about what you've achieved to get where you are Anytime you need a boost of confidence, pull out this list, read it out loud to yourself, and it can really help you. Keep in mind that each person has a unique perspective and contribution. That's what makes the world interesting and it helps the workplace run. It's important to understand that women can also bring different perspectives than men, which is one of the many advantages of including women in leadership and women in the workplace. Ultimately, your strengths define you more than your weaknesses. When you realize you are likely your harshest critic, it can help you realize that you're good at what you do and have many strengths. Remember, anytime you need a boost of confidence to get out your list of strengths and review it. When we set attainable goals, it can help improve our confidence. Start by setting small goals. The goals can be something that you are trying to improve about yourself, something that you may fear. Some examples may be to talk to one new person a week, attend two webinars a month, read a new leadership book a month. They can even be goals at home because improving confidence in your personal life carries over to your professional life as well. Maybe these goals could be something like complete a house project, refinish a piece of furniture, Maybe take a pottery class and display your work in your house. Whatever your goals may be, setting them as smaller attainable goals can help you see your progress. The more you do, the more your confidence will grow. You probably have all heard before that comparison is the thief of joy. I believe firmly in this. And in today's world of social media, with instant access to people to compare yourself to, it can be really hard to not do it. When you, want, when you start comparing yourselves to others, you often focus on what you are lacking instead of what you have accomplished. It is hard to build confidence when you do this. It can be common for women in the workplace to compare themselves to the men in the room. This is not fair and is definitely not helpful. We need to look past gender and see, what peop see people for what they contribute. One thing that can help when you compare yourself to others is to know your why. Why are you doing this? What do you want to get out of being a leader? Are you doing it to help others? Because you enjoy it? Because you like to contribute to bigger things? Focusing on your why can help when you start to compare yourself to others. Your why may be different than theirs, so why would you be like them?
I believe that executive presence is also a really important thing to building confidence. Executive presence is basically looking the part and acting the part. Executive presence is important because it helps increase your impact, it can help you influence others, which can help you grow your career, and in turn help grow your confidence. Some people say fake it until you make it. I prefer to look at this as looking and acting the part. It can help give you the confidence that you can do something, will help you feel like you are the part as well. And this in turn builds, uh, builds your confidence. There are a number of aspects of executive presence. One of them is to dress the job just for the job that you want. A good example of this is during an interview. You won't get a job because of what you wear, but you could lose a job offer because of what you wear. If you're unsure, dress up more, not less. This can also apply to business meetings or even every day at the office. As much as we don't like it, appearances do matter and first impressions stick with people. I often wear business suit to meetings, even though I know others won't. It just gives me that little boost of confidence that I know that I look the part and I, it helps me feel like I belong in the room. You can also think about taking up space. Think of a man in a meeting. You often think of him with his arms spread wide apart, maybe even sitting back in his chair. When he crosses his legs, they're crossed in a wide stance and takes up a lot of room. Oftentimes, if you think of a woman, you may think of her sitting with her arms closer together, maybe sitting on the front of her chair, and if her legs are crossed, they're in more of a narrow stance. Women can take up more space by spreading their arms out wider, standing up while giving a presentation instead of sitting down, or when sitting down, spread your arms out wide in your chair. While these seem like little things, they can help improve your confidence in a meeting, and people may even see and listen to you more. Another item is to act the part. There are a number of things that go along with this, one of which is to be concise. Many executives don't have a lot of time, so being concise and to the point helps others understand your point or your ask. I often write an email and then reread it to see what I can take out. Or you can put your conclusion or your ask at the beginning of the email so people that are scanning it quickly can see what your what your main points are. This is kind of like the elevator pitch that probably most of the people on, online have heard about. The concept of, um, you know, you're starting your own business and you have, um, you happen to be in the elevator with an investor. You've got a minute or two to, um, to basically make your pitch and sell your company. Uh, a lot of business communications, especially with leadership or executives, can be similar to that. You need to get to the point. Another item is to respond and not react. This means take the time to evaluate a situation and your response. Reacting shows your emotion to the situation. If you take a second to breathe before responding, you can more easily remove the emotion and stick with the facts in your response. This small change can prevent a lot of issues and help connect with others while having difficult conversations. Another item is to not, not to discount yourself. Phrases that discount what you say include using the word sorry, there have been very few business communications where you should use this word. Only when you are truly sorry and actually have a plan of action to accompany it. Just is another word that minimize what, minimizes what you have to say. If you use just in your communications, try removing it and it will typically make your sentence stronger and not impact the meaning. But is another word. When you use this, people commonly forget everything you said before but and just focus on what comes after that. And finally, a little is another phrase that can be removed from business communication. It's not very descriptive and it typically minimizes your statement. These, these words make you sound like you aren't sure about what you want to say. Look for these types of phrases in your communications and try to remove them as often as possible. There are a number of other words that can be removed as well if you're interested in learning more about this, there are a lot of resources online about persuasive business communicate, communications. Upspeak is another, um, something else that women tend to do. This is when you make a statement sound like a question. 
One example is, it's sunny outside. When the end of the sentence is a higher, it sounds like you are asking a question. Compare that to, it's sunny outside. This, for, this way of saying it is a lot more confident and sounds like a statement. When you upspeak, it sounds like you aren't sure if what you are saying is correct. So consider that and pay attention to that when you're speaking. Being prepared is another way to increase your executive presence. An executive that has been doing this forever may not have to prepare as much because it comes naturally to them. But if you are newer or you don't have as much confidence, being prepared can be really helpful. This could mean practicing your presentations, your sales pitches, or practicing a hard conversation that you know you need to have. Putting in the time so you can learn the lingo, do your research so you are prepared for any questions that may come up, and even getting input from trusted coworkers on a presentation or a new concept. Whatever is relevant to you and necessary to give you the confidence needed to know that you will do well. If you don't feel confident yet, act like you do. You may have heard of power poses, or the Wonder Woman pose specifically. These are ways to stand that can help increase confidence. The Wonder Woman pose is where you stand with, with your fist placed on your waist, your legs shoulder width apart, and your chin tilted upward slightly. Stand like this for a minute or two while breathing, and it can make you feel much more powerful. Other power poses include standing at a table or desk with your hands on the chair. This can make you feel like you own the room. Another one, which works a little easier if you're in your own office is to sit at your chair with your feet up on your desk and your hands raised behind your head. This can make you feel powerful as well. If this is something you're interested in learning more about, there's a TED talk about this and lots of other resources online. Instead of fake it until you make it, these are ways that you can act it until you are it. We need to be kind to ourselves. We can be our own harshest critics many times. One way to do this is to work on having a positive mindset. A positive mindset is where when you've got a thought in your head, you can change that to a more positive thought. And over time doing this, it becomes uh, second nature to change your, your thought process into a more positive. A few examples, um, one example includes if you're thinking to yourself, I don't see anyone like me, I don't belong here. Changing that thought process to, I don't see anyone like me, I can bring a different perspective. Just that little change makes it feel a lot more positive and can help bring, bring you confidence. A few other examples include, if you're thinking, I'm not good at this, change that to, I'm not good at this yet. This is really the, the um, positive mindset and the growth mindset that I talked about earlier in the presentation. Another example is, I don't have a role model that I can relate to. So instead of that, you can change it to, what can I learn from this role model, even though I don't relate to them? Or I don't have anyone to help at home. Changing this thought process to, who can I ask to help, is more solutions-based. Finally, I really messed that conversation up. Instead of thinking like that, you can change your thought to, that conversation didn't go how I planned. What could I do differently next time? So having this positive mindset can help us get rid of the excuses and open us up to trying new things, which as I've discussed is important to gaining confidence. So once you have your seat at the table, you need to know that you are worthy of being there. You made it. You deserve to be here based on your achievements and your capabilities. This one was hard for me. Before I was promoted to my current position as director, I had worked really hard. I stepped out of my comfort zone to ask for help during a trying time. Once we made it through, I finally got the promotion I'd been working for. I was excited, but still a little unsure of myself. I removed my old email signature with my old title, but I didn't feel confident enough to put my new director title in the email. Looking back, I'm not sure why. I knew I deserved the position and I'd worked hard, but I was just not confident enough. 
to add the title into my email signature. I don't know if anyone else noticed, but finally a year later, I told my husband and he convinced me that I deserved to be where I was. And at that time, I finally had gained enough confidence to add the title into my signature line. So even people that have made it into leadership may still struggle with confidence. So please know that if this is you, that you're not alone. So once you are in leadership, you may wonder how you can manage it all. It's important to become a master of prioritization. This doesn't happen overnight, but it's important to gain an understanding of what will be needed to be dealt with immediately and what can sit for a while before dealing with it. I read this example one time, and I honestly don't remember where it's from, but I, I've found it very relevant over the years. It's that our days are filled with us juggling many different balls. Some of the balls are glass and other balls are made of plastic. At some point, you are probably juggling so many balls that you're going to drop a few. The key is to know which balls are glass and which balls are plastic. You know if you drop a plastic ball, it will be okay. It won't break. But we have to be sure to keep the glass balls or the things that are really important in the air. A few things to help with this are to learn to ask for what you need. If this is a flexible work arrangement, maybe another person to join your team, whatever it is, please be confident to ask for what you need. Just asking doesn't guarantee that you'll get it, but you know that if you don't ask, you'll have no chance. Another important concept that helps to manage everything is to stop striving for perfection. Perfection is the enemy of progress is a famous quote by Winston Churchill. It's, it's relevant in the workplace as well. Sometimes the desire for something to be perfect can prevent people from doing things. Or the flip side of that is striving to be per perfect can make things take so much longer and prevent work on other important items. So being cognizant of this concept can, help, can be helpful when you feel like you are having trouble managing it all. Delegating is also critical. As you become a leader, your vision is important, and sometimes you can have other people help you implement your vision. Delegating can scale your impact faster and help you accomplish more, but you need to become comfortable delegating to other people. It's helpful to have a team that you can trust. Be sure to set clear expectations with your team or whoever you are delegating to. And you also have to learn to give up some of the control. This definitely takes practice and patience, but learning this can help you manage it all and scale your impact. So once you're in leadership, there are a number of skills for success. There's so much information out there about leadership, so I'm sure I don't have anything new here, but I would still like to share a few things that have helped me become successful as a leader. First of all, communication is critical. You need to be able to communicate your ideas clearly, both with superiors and your peers, and with anyone that reports to you. Positive communication is extremely important. As a leader, we need to inspire others. It's hard to do that if you don't remain positive. I also like to say that words matter. Being intentional with your choice of words can go a long way. Even just a slight change in how something is worded can make a big difference. For example, if I say, you have to figure that out, it makes it sound like it's not my problem and I don't want to help. Changing that to, let's try to figure this out, is a much more inclusive statement and it implies that people are working together. As a leader, you also have to listen to others. This includes listening to others' viewpoints, ideas, and even their concerns. But in addition to that, it's helpful to listen to what people aren't saying as well. If you ask a question and someone answers a different question, maybe there's a reason and it could be worth figuring out or digging into a little, a little more deeply. To continue to have the growth mindset I talked about earlier, you can continue to challenge your own thinking. Times change and your ideas can change and evolve too. It's okay to change your mind as you learn more, as you listen to others and see more data. It's also necessary to continue to learn from others. You may work with someone with a different experience or a different way of thinking. 
Treating this as a way to continue to improve your business and yourself can have a very positive impact on your ability to lead. Ask for help when needed. You may feel vulnerable when doing this, but it can be a sign of strength. At one, at one time, I was in a position where we had a lot of business come in all at once, and I was down a person on a team that was already very small. There was so much going on, um, and it was really hard to manage everything. It was to the point that I was almost ready to quit because I didn't know what to do. So I told my sister this, and we were talking about it, and she said, why don't you just ask for help? So I said, you know what, that's a really good idea. And so I went into the office, and I asked for help. We sat down. We developed a plan with how people from different sections of the organization would be able to help temporarily, and we got through that tough challenge. Had I not asked for help, I, I wouldn't be in my current position. I definitely wouldn't have been promoted into leadership. So thankfully, I was able to step out of my comfort zone, ask for help, which ultimately was a sign of strength and was part of what leaded to my promotion. Finally, uh, we need to learn how to have difficult conversations, how to talk about a problem without making someone else mad. This gets into the positive communication that I just talked about. There are a lot of resources av available about having difficult conversations, and this is critical to learn as a leader. Finally, help others to get a seat at the table. You didn't get here without help. The best way to thank other people for helping you is to pay it forward and help others. So as you find your confidence to say yes, above all else, be yourself and believe in yourself. When you believe in yourself and your potential, you will learn to take bigger steps and then you will start to see bigger outcomes. I started the presentation by saying that I almost said no to doing this webinar. When I got the courage to say yes, I reminded myself it's something I've been interested in doing for a while and there is growth in the uncomfortable. So I believed in myself, stepped out of my comfort zone and I said yes. I hope that you have learned something new for my presentation today and then it can help give you the confidence to say yes. Thank you for your time today, and thank you to the United Conference of Women Leaders and Pharma for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Ms. Rebecca, for this very interesting talk and the nice information you have shared with us. And the stage now is open for any question. Please write your uh, question in the chat section, or if you want, you can unmute yourself and say your question. And meanwhile, I have one question, like, it's always hard when you go for interviews to control your nerves, you know, when they start ask you, you might have the idea how to answer it, but you're, because you are nervous, you are not able to give the idea in a clear way, or even in a nice way that convince them with you, how to control our nerves in such intimidated, like, uh, moments, you know, it's always hard to control that moment. Yeah, I agree. Um, honestly, I think one thing that helps me is to take a second, take a breath before responding. Maybe even if you have a glass of water next to you, <laughs> take a drink. Uh, that gives you just a few seconds. Um, and you can kind of use that time to gather your thoughts. Um, and I do find that helpful, even, even just having a few extra seconds to do that. Um, something else, too, I, I think it is okay in an interview to say, you know, let me gather my thoughts and think about it for you know, a few seconds and, and before responding. I think that um, shows that you're thoughtful in your, your responses, um, which I appreciate. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this, like, very interesting topic again. And thank you for being here and giving, giving us the time and the effort. Thank you. I guess now we don't have any more questions. We can go for our next speaker because like,